Okay, so uh, let us uh, uh, continue. Uh, so uh, I'm going to have a look at a few more suttas from the Bojanga Sangyuta. I should have mentioned that we are now uh, in the Bojanga Sangyuta, which is the connected discourses on the awakening factors. And there's a large number of discourses there, and I've, I've chosen some of the ones that I thought might be most interesting. Uh, so that's why where these suttas come from. So, but you are, of course, welcome to have a look yourself uh, at these suttas. Uh, they're all there. There's about 150 altogether, maybe only about 50 or 60 that are really substantial. The rest are just like repetitions and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, the next one is called Sikh. Uh, and uh, so, uh, let's have a look at this one. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Rajagaha in the bamboo grove. Uh, uh, the squirrel's feeding ground. Uh, now at that time he was sick, suffering and gravely ill. Uh, then Venerable Mahachunda went up to the Buddha, bowed and sat down to one side. Uh, and the Buddha said to him, uh, Chunda, express your understanding of the awakening factors, uh, the seven bojangas. Uh, so uh, here we, the Buddha is staying in Rajagaha, the bamboo grove, called, known as the Veluvana. And uh, yesterday, when we went out, not yesterday, the day before yesterday, went out walking, we went to a bamboo place that uh, Bobby informed me, this is like the bamboo grove. Uh, <laughs> there was all these famous bamboo, n nice bamboos up there. Uh, so uh, Velu is bamboo in Pali, Vana is like forest or grove or something like that. Uh, Velu Vana. So express your understanding of the awakening factors, uh, uh, which is basically just uh, recite the awakening factors or talk about them or something like that. And this is what Mahachunda said. Mahachunda, by the way, is supposed to have been a brother of Venerable Sariputta. Uh, and he was one of the, another of the great monks at that time, uh, supposed to have been Arahant and, and all of those things. Uh. Sir, the Buddha has rightly explained the seven awakening, fac awakening factors. Uh, when developed and cultivated, they lead to direct knowledge. Uh, to awakening, to extinguishment, which is Nibbana. What seven? The awakening factor of mindfulness, uh, the awakening factor of investigation of Dhammas or principles, uh, the awakening factor of energy, uh, the awakening factor of joy or rapture, uh, the awakening factor of uh, uh, tranquility, uh, the awakening factor of samadhi, the awakening factor of equanimity. Uh, so in each one of those, it is kind of expanded. So it has the, when developed and cultivated, uh, it leads to these things for each one of them. Uh. These are the seven awakening factors that the Buddha has rightly explained. Uh. When developed and cultivated, they lead to direct knowledge, uh, to awakening and to extinguishment. Uh. And then the Buddha replies, Indeed, Chunda, these are the awakening factors. Uh. Indeed, Chunda, these are the awakening factors. Uh. This is what Chunda said, uh, and the teacher approved, uh, and that's how the Buddha recovered from that illness. Uh. <laughs> it's quite, quite amazing, isn't it? That's why I put it in there, because it's quite amazing. It's quite so, sort of uh, unexpected. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> and there are a few suttas like that where uh, the, uh, the, the bojangas are recited, uh, and when they are recited, they actually lead to uh, the sa same uh, the same consequence. You are you, you become you, you, your illness is left behind. Usually, it's not the Buddha. This is what is astonishing about this one. It's about the Buddha, but in most cases, it's about other people uh, who actually do that. Uh, and because of this, when uh, you will notice that when the monks go and visit a sick person, uh, what is the what is it that they recite? Bojangas. This is the reason, yeah? Do people then stand out of bed afterwards and they are, are freed from illness? Uh, <laughs> usually not. Uh, why not? It's supposed to say here, yeah, you end of <laughs> the end of illness, uh, you come out of illness, why, why doesn't it work? Uh, and I think this is kind of the point, what this sutta is pointing to, is that uh, the Buddha here is obviously, he's kind of elated, maybe he's kind of lost a bit of energy, but if you are really, really ill, you know, it's very hard to get the energy up and maybe, so, um, may maybe the important point is that the Buddha understands what is going on. Uh, when a monk or nun goes to hospital these days, we recite the Bojangas in Pali. Uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> nobody has a clue what is being recited. And of course, that doesn't have any impact on the people. Uh, 
Moreover, it is also about the patient's ability to really understand the teaching. How can you understand the Bhujangas unless you have experienced them? You can't really understand what they are here. So this is why the Bhujangas in the suttas, they are often expressed to people who can understand it. And when you understand what these are, is it, that they lead to awakening, they lead to Nibbana, they ha have all these kind of wonderful, marvelous qualities, uh, then of course it's easy, if you know, it is more easy to get that rapture, the joy and the energy in the mind. Uh, and it is that energy, it seems, that in the rapture in the mind that actually somehow enables you to overcome that, that illness. Uh, yeah, I, exactly how it works, I don't know, but that seems to be the idea here, that energy inside, when you have no energy, when you have no positivity in the mind, the illness tends to take over. But if you have positive, energetic, mind um, clarity, then the illness is often abate. Uh, and we know that that is true also from a modern uh, medical point of view. It is fairly well known that uh, uh, the people in hospital who are the most positive and uh, uh, least uh, pessimistic and etc. tend to recover first. Yeah, it, your mental attitude to what is going on actually is very important uh, for your ability to recover from operations and these kind of things. Uh, and this is kind of fairly fairly well known. And often it is called like the placebo effect or whatever because nobody really understands these things uh, because uh, in our modern world we are a bit backwards. Uh, is that right? We're a bit backwards. Uh, sometimes we're a bit, bit backwards yeah, compared to some of these early spiritual teachings. Uh, it's good to remember that. Sometimes we are so proud of our modern culture. Yeah, we've got everything sorted out. We've got the science is really going well. We've got all this technology. But what's the big deal with iPhones? Uh, yeah, it's not such a big deal. Some of these other things are, are kind of, you know, are just a little bit more important than iPhones. Uh, you know what I mean? Huh? So, uh, and so this is the... Um, the problem is that sometimes we don't really understand how these things work. Yeah. But with the Buddha, uh, and you kind of bring that energy back into the mind, uh, and the power of the mind to affect the body, uh, all that energy and the joy actually is uh, attested even in the modern world, uh, but certainly it was attested by the Buddha as well. Uh. So some of these ancient wisdoms uh, are, are wisdoms that are kind of there as part of the culture, uh, and that we kind of, uh, you know, we're still kind of behind the times in our modern world to really appreciate some of these modern wisdoms fully. Uh, people already knew these things uh, and uh, we're kind of playing catch up still with what happened two and a half thousand years ago. Huh? So uh, this is what happens and it's kind of astonishing that this is true even for the Buddha but what it shows you and it's one of the things that I have kind of been trying to mention uh, all along is the idea that the Buddha in the end he is a human being just like the rest of us uh, and when he gets sick and then obviously he also will lose his energy because it's just a natural consequence of being sick so then you uh, use the Bojangas to counteract that and then when somebody else recites it you hear it from the outsider uh, and they may be recited in a way that is uh, inspiring then bang things come back to you uh, but it is a bit strange. Uh, so you, you wonder, is it possible that this sutta maybe is not uh, real? This, this maybe this didn't happen? Uh, I haven't actually checked whether it has any parallels. Uh, uh, it may very well have parallels to it. I'm actually, I, sh I should be quite easy to, to find out because uh, usually these things are... Sorry? Yes, exactly. You had to go to Sutta Central to find this out. Uh, uh, four parallels in ancient texts, it says here. Yeah, so there's supposed to be a parallel in the in Chinese translation, two parallels in Chinese translation, one in the Sangyukta Agama, one in the uh, Ekotarika Agama, huh? and also a, fra a fragment, Sanskrit fragment as well. Huh? So uh, this, seems to, this seems to be a sutta that was found across in many different traditions uh, in um, Buddhism. I've actually got Sutta Central right here in front of me, so very handy. I can see all the parallels or whatever here. So, uh, 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 for that reason, there is probably a fairly good reason to think that this was a genuine sutta. And another reason to think it is genuine is to is precisely because it is a bit counterintuitive. Uh, you wonder why the Buddha needs someone like Mahachunda to recite the Bodhangas. Uh, it seems kind of counter to what we expect of the Buddha. And because it is counter to what we expect, uh, it is unlikely that it would have been made up by somebody just randomly, because it kind of goes against the against the stream of things. Uh, it goes against how people normally view the Buddha. So uh, when things are strange about the Buddha that make him seem kind of more ordinary, uh, then very often this is about, uh, uh, these can be authentic texts precisely because nobody else would dare to put them in there. Uh, yeah, when the Buddha says he has some problem or something strange going on, nobody would dare to say that about the Buddha. So for that reason, sometimes uh, it is one of the 
uh, traits of a sutta which kind of make it more likely to be authentic. Okay, anyway, that's my, my view on that one. Uh, so this is the uh, sickness sutta. Uh, are you okay? We have a sick one down there. Shall we chant, chant the Bojangas for you? <laughs> 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 are, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, there we are. So now uh, we come to another sutta. Uh, this is called the body. Uh, kaya. Ka is it Kaya? Oh, is it? Okay, th thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it's called, Kaya Sutta, exactly. Okay. Uh, so, um, and this Sutta is, uh, uh, is a, this is just an extract here, uh, and it's quite a long one. It has a, it's about the Bojangas, but it's also about the five hindrances. And in this case, I have taken out the part on the five hindrances, because that, I think, is the part which is uh, different here than from any of the other suttas. I will have a look at the, uh, the Bojanga part, I will look at anyway. But the hindrance part is kind of, uh, I don't have anywhere else, so I thought I would look at that. Uh, and uh, it's interesting how the five hindrances are found in the Bojangas. Uh, yeah, together with the, with the Bojangas in the Bojanga Sangyuta, how come the hindrances are found together with the Bojangas? Uh, surely they have, what, what do they have, do they have anything in common? Uh, well, th I think the whole point is that they have nothing in common. They are, in fact, they are exact opposites. Uh, yeah, They are almost like the inverse of each other. And that is why they often occur together. And that's why you find them in places like the Bojanga Sangyutas. Uh, and they are inverse in the sense that when the hindrances go down, the Bojangas go up. Uh, so the less you have the hi of the hindrances, the more you have of the Bojangas. Uh, the less you have the Bojangas, the more you tend to have of the hindrances. Uh, so as the hindrances go down, mindfulness starts to kick in. Uh, the more the hindrances go down, the more mindfulness, energy and joy and all of these other factors start to arise. Uh, so they are inverse, and this is why they are, uh, they are kind of put together in this way, so that we uh, do this in tandem, you in tandem the overcoming of the hindrances uh, and the giving rise to the bojangas. Uh, in fact, the giving rise to the bojangas, there's only so much you can do to give rise to them directly. Uh, so what we have to do instead is that we actually have to work on the hindrances. Uh, that is where the work really is at. Uh, yeah? So this uh, particular uh, that sutta then is about the hindrances and a, about a little bit about how they arise. Uh, and it's very similar to what we find also in the Satipatthana Sutta. Uh, and uh, so uh, I thought this might be a good opportunity to have a look at these hindrances. Uh, so uh, this is uh, 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 the, the sutta, the second sutta of the Bojanga Sangyutta, and it's at Savati, and it goes as follows. Mendicants, this body is sustained by food. It depends on food to continue, and without food it does not continue. In the same way, the five hindrances are sustained by fuel. They depend on fuel to continue, and without fuel they don't. So, uh, this is obviously an important thing. Uh, the body is a conditioned phenomenon. The body just exists because it is born and then you have to sustain it throughout life, otherwise it, uh, it dies. Uh, and this is the same thing that we see here. Uh, and uh, the hindrances are exactly like that. They only exist because of certain causes and conditions. Uh, and this is precisely why it is possible to overcome the hindrances. Uh, if they existed without cause and condition, if they were just there, you couldn't overcome them because they were independent of anything else. Uh, but it is precisely because they exist because of causes that we can overcome the five hindrances. Uh, so we need to investigate the causes of the hindrances. Uh, and as we investigate that, uh, you will have more idea what you can do to reduce them in the future. Uh, so. Uh, this, so let's start with the first one. What, uh, and what fuels the arising of sensual desire? Uh, or when it has arisen, uh, makes it increase and grow. So this is how sensual, arises, sensual desire comes to arise. Uh, there is the feature of beauty. Uh, frequent improper attention to that fuels the arising of sensual desire. Or when it has arisen, makes it increase and grow. Now the feature of beauty is the subha nimitta. 
Uh, so this is the aspect of beauty in anything. The nimitta is, a, is in this case, it actually means a, a certain characteristic, a property of something. Yeah, and everything in the world has different properties. So the same thing may have both the asuba and suba nimitta at the same time. But it's how we look at the thing, whether we give rise to the suba nimitta or the asuba nimitta. We can look at the same thing from different angles. Uh. Yeah, and uh, it's it, it very obvious in terms of people. In terms of people, you can see someone as attractive, uh, and then that's seeing the suba nimitta in someone, uh, or you can see them as unattractive. You look at their corpse or something like that. Yeah, you look at them, uh, and these things, and exactly the same person can seem attractive, unattractive, depending on how you look at them. Uh, you can see them as impermanent, changing, getting old, eventually, you know, b b uh, being a corpse, uh, and then you are seeing the unattractive side. Uh, or you can forget about uh, the reality of, of things uh, and then you see the super side of that person and then of course attraction can arise and this is what we is meant here by sensual desire. Remember sensual desire here is very broad. Uh, it refers to any kind of attraction to any object through the five senses, any kind of attachment. Uh, so important to remember that. Uh, it's not a narrow thing at all, it's an extremely broad uh, a type of desire that involves almost your entire life, basically. Yeah. So uh, this is how it arises. Yeah, I, and if you pay improper attention, this is ayoniso manasikara. I think. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're already always ahead of me, Wajena sister. You, which is uh, which is good uh, because. Uh, yeah, ayonesa manasikara bahulikaro. Bahulikaro means um, often, uh, frequently. Uh, uh, then, uh, when you do that, then uh, it, you, you give rise to this uh, attraction or this uh, defilement of desire because you see that. And remember again, as I'm saying, as I'm saying it's very, very broad. So this can't just be about. Uh, it can be about something like anything in your life, like food or any material. Uh, object you have in your life, you have a nice car, a nice home, some nice clothes or whatever it is, uh, all of these things we can feel a desire towards. Uh, and one way to know whether you have desire is just to ask yourself what would happen if somebody took it away from you. Uh, and if it make you upset and it make you, uh, usually it does, uh, yeah, if it is yours, uh, then you know that there was some desire, underlying desire there for those things, some attachment to it. Uh, that's how you know. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, so it's a very, very broad category. Huh? So how do we counter this? What, what, how do we actually, how do we see things in another way? And this is very much uh, some of the part, some of the things I was telling you about before, huh? when we did the uh, Potalia Sutta, we're looking at the seven similes for the sensual objects of the world and sensual desire. Huh? Yeah, and uh, these. Uh, these similes actually directly counteract sensual desire. Huh? And these similes are all about how unreliable the things of the world are, huh? how prone they are to impermanence and to being out of control, huh? how it is like a dream, you never actually really get what you want anyway, how they are borrowed goods, which is again about impermanence, uh, how we fight over these things that they are, you know, we always end up having conflicts, yeah, you know, if I don't know if you I remember when I was young, I wanted someone to drive my parents' car, and they, you know, you, and you have a conflict with your parents whether you can drive it, and if you can drive it, and when you can drive it, and all these kind of things, you know. Or, or everything is like that. There's always these things always kind of lead to problems, and uh, uh, and then there was the uh, uh, the simile of the hungry dog, yeah, running around. Uh, and uh, then the Buddha says, talks about uh, everything that is dear and agreeable, you must become otherwise. All of these things are about the unreliability of the sensory world, the sensory objects, including our relationships. Yeah, That's true also. Uh, our, even our family members, all of that is included in that. Uh, so by remembering that, you are remembering the disadvantage, the adinava it is called in Pali, the disadvantage of sensuality. Uh, you are seeing it more from the asuba point of view. Asuba means the non-beautiful point of view. The a prefix is doesn't necessarily mean the negative of suba, so it means the doesn't necessarily mean the repulsive or ugly, it can just mean the lack of beauty, uh, the a. Uh. So you're seeing it from a point of view which is the opposite. So all of these things uh, help you to reduce the sensual desire and attachment to uh, things in the world, the five, the five senses. Uh. 
So this is why I read that out, because it actually directly counteracts the first hindrance. Uh, so if you, but it's kind of a nice way of doing it, uh, instead of doing cemetery contemplations or whatever, which sometimes can get a bit too much. Uh, and there is a, I don't know if you know about this, there's a, the origin story to the first Parajika rule, the first Parajika rule is a rule about not, um, uh, no, not the first one. The third Parajika rule is about not being allowed to kill human beings. If you kill a human being as a monk, then you are no longer a monk, or you are no longer a nun if you are a nun. And uh, the origin story, that is a kind of a horrifying origin story, uh, when the monks start to commit suicide. Uh, and they have this man, a very simpleton man, who they tell him, oh please, kill us, if you kill me, I will give you my ball and robe. <laughs> So he, he thinks, oh yeah, I get a ball and robe, okay, I better kill you then. So then he goes around killing all these monks. And then the Buddha comes out of seclusion, and he sees the Sangha is much smaller. And he asks, Ananda, how come the Sangha is so small? Ah, oh, because uh, the monks have been doing too much asuba practice, uh, so they started killing themselves. Uh. And the Buddha says, wait a minute, that's no good. So then he teaches them Anapanasati, uh, yeah, mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. So it's kind of a, an, another one of those strange stories in the suttas. It's a very strange one, and it's very hard to really come to grips with what is going on. Something like that is likely to have happened. Uh, not sure exactly what it is, uh, uh, because again, it is a story that exists across the various traditions. Uh. But the point is, really, that what a point I'm trying to kind of get across is that asuba uh, practice can be very, uh, can be very unpleasant, uh, and it often goes directly against the grain of what we do in the world. Uh. So if it, because it goes directly against the grain, often it's not very effective. Uh. Yeah, if, you have, if you are prone to sensual pleasures, and most people are, even as monastics there's a degree of sensual pleasures. Yeah? When I go downstairs to lunch and I see the f all the food there, uh, you know, I think, whoa, jeepers, uh, okay, I better restrain myself now, otherwise it's going to look really bad. Uh, and <laughs> so, but you can see, it's there's, there's very hard to pull completely back from that. Uh, and even when you, even a noble person, actually, ob obviously they're able to enjoy the food, uh, but they don't give rise to the desire. So it is a kind of a, uh, the difference between the two is not always all that obvious. Uh, uh, so, but because they are so counter a super practice, the 31 parts of the body, the cemetery contemplation, are so counter to how we normally live our lives. Uh, for a monastic, these things can be useful because obviously as a monastic, you, you know, because, you, uh, because, because of the lifestyle of celibacy, uh, you have to be much more careful with these kind of things. But uh, for lay people in general, I don't think it is all that useful because there's a clash between how we normally live uh, and then these kind of practices. And when there is that clash, uh, what is going to win out uh, is the normal lifestyle uh, because that is uh, uh, more attractive and more interesting. So we have to find a way of dealing with sensuality that, that is not so harsh, I think, generally speaking. I would not recommend these kind of uh, asuba practices for people in general because it is too counter to how we, how we live and I, th I don't think it's a good idea. Instead, use this general contemplation about the danger in things. Uh, and the Buddha specifically said, as we saw before, how Everyone, lay people, monastics, men and women, everyone should use the contemplation like everything that is dear and agreeable to me must become otherwise. Uh, that is already a very profound contemplation on the dangers of the sensual world, uh, the sensual objects. Uh, I think that sort of thing is far more useful uh, and it's kind of the thing the Buddha had in mind uh, when he spoke to, uh, spoke to us, all of us really. Uh, uh, and. Uh, so that, so that is where I think the most of the attention uh, can be put. Uh. So this is how you deal with this, yeah? And when you remember these things, when that right view of the nature of the world is kind of deeply embedded in you, uh, then you start gradually, slowly, slowly, you start to have a different attitude to the material world, to the uh, world outside. Uh. Yes, it is still important. Yes, we need all of these things. Uh, but you understand that the real value in life, real meaning in life, uh, is actually found somewhere else. Uh, it is found on the spiritual path. Uh, that is where uh, uh, you, you can find something that is truly satisfactory. Uh, if you rely on the material world too much, uh, uh, the objects of the five senses too much, you end up becoming very disappointed. Uh, and when you come to the end of your life, you feel like you wasted your entire life, uh, because now it all has to be left behind. Uh, nothing you can do with it, uh, and you have nothing in your heart, uh, nothing that you can carry with you into the future. So very simple contemplations, but when you think about them, also so obvious in a way. Uh, and that is why they are powerful, because they are quite obvious. Uh. 
So, um, subanimita, yes, seeing the beauty in things uh, is uh, uh, where the problem arises. So what kind of things is it that we uh, should not see the beauty in? Is, is it, does this include all things? Uh, and the answer is no. We are, you are allowed to see the beauty in certain things. Uh, yeah? There are certain things that actually are conducive to the path. Uh, so seeing the beauty in the breath when you're meditating, uh, yeah? having a sense of metta and compassion for the people around you, uh, Having, uh, uh, having generally the sense of joy and all of these kind of things, uh, seeing, being, you know, being kind of excited by the Dhamma and, and being inspired by that, uh, all of these things, obviously, this is the right kind of Subha. In fact, one of the meditations mentioned by the Buddha, he, he, he calls it when you practice the Brahma Viharas and in the right way, you become Subhang Adimutto. Uh, and Adimutta means like focused on, uh, and what you're focused on is the beautiful, Subha. It's exactly the same word as you use here. So in that case, you are focused on the Subha, and it's a good thing. Uh, but because it is good, because it, it is c comes from, uh, it is based on uh, the, pr uh, the practice of the Brahma Viharas, that is the right kind of Subha. And that kind of Subha, I anyway, is far more powerful, far more beautiful than any of these lower kinds of suba that we're talking about when we talk about the sensual realm. Uh, so again, it's about dividing the world into, it's often like this, often people like to ask questions, is this right or is that right? But very often you cannot say whether one thing is right or another thing is right. Often you have to analyze the situation more carefully. Uh, people ask, if I act like this, is that bad or good karma? Well, I can't say. The, is the kamma is not in the action, the kamma is in the intention. Uh, but very people often ask, oh, can, I, can I do this? I don't know, you look at your mind. You have to, you have to find out for yourself. Uh, and people don't want to find out for, for themselves, they want to have an answer on the plate, yeah? so, so they know what to do. Uh, but because thinking for yourself is often takes more, uh, takes more effort, uh, and uh, people sometimes don't want to go through the effort. Uh, but that is where you learn, when you go through the effort, that's where the real understanding arises. Uh. So there you are, uh, sensual desire, how it increases yeah, by focusing on the beauty of things. Oh, this, this is so nice, I must have this, uh, and whatever it is. Uh, and then you realize uh, uh, the, the downside by focusing on in, in the right way, and that is called proper attention. Yoniso manasikara, you are depriving the thing of its fuel, and because you are depriving it of its fuel, then the desire uh, 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 decreases and eventually disappears altogether. Yeah. And uh, maybe just briefly, the, uh, you know, this is one of the things that happens in your meditation if you practice mindfulness of breathing. Uh, one of the things about mindfulness of breathing is that because you're watching the breath, you're no longer attending to those things that fuel desire or fuel ill will. Uh, for ill will and desire to be that has to be fueled all the time. You have to remember the beauty in something, or you have to remember that you are upset with someone. Uh, and when you remember that, then the ill will and the desire are fueled. Uh, but if you stay with the breath, uh, you are taking away the fuel. Uh, this is one of the reasons why staying with the breath actually leads to a reduction in defilements. Uh, so if you're able to focus on the breath, uh, taking away your attention from the other things, actually, gradually, the defilements decline because you are no longer looking at those things uh, that uh, are the fuel uh, for these problems of the mind. Uh, yeah, so it's pretty obvious when you think about it, uh, but uh, uh, not, not something that kind of normally you, you, you would probably think about because uh, it is kind of u unusual from a certain point of view. Huh? Anyway, let's move on to the next one. Huh? Uh, okay. I've got so many drinks over here, it's just amazing. It's <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and what fuels the arising of ill will, or when it has arisen, makes it increase and grow? There is the feature of harshness. Frequent improper attention to that fuels the arising of ill will, and when it has arisen, makes it increase and grow. Uh, harshness here, so uh, again, ill will is just like sensuality, it can only exist when it is fueled, uh, yeah? Take away the fuel and uh, ill will decreases. Uh, harshness here is patiga in Pali, uh, and patiga is often that which is uh, 
uh, something that you resist. Yeah, sometimes it's translated as a resistance. Uh, and when you feel that you resist something, you don't really want to see it. You don't want to deal with it. Uh, uh, you, uh, you feel resistance. That, that is often where ill will can arise. Uh, so if someone speaks to you in a way that is unpleasant, you, you kind of resist that. You don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, and that is where ill will can arise through other people's uh, bad speech. Yeah. So anything that where you feel that there is a resistance, that it's something you don't like, that is unpleasant, uh, that is harsh in this way, uh, that is where ill will can arise as a consequence. Uh, and uh, of course the good thing about that is that again it is about how we perceive the world that really uh, then uh, enables us to uh, to deal with this. Uh, if we just kind of blindly follow along and we feel all these harsh things happening to us, uh, ill will is bound to happen. Uh, but if we look at it in a stri slightly different way uh, uh, and we change our perspective and we don't think of it as harsh anymore, we think of it perhaps only as nature. This is one nice way of thinking about all of these difficult things. Uh, they are natural things that happen. You can't really avoid them. Uh, then the ill will very often subsides uh, because you focus it, you learn to focus it in a different way. Again, this is a difference between proper attention and improper attention. So what does that mean in practice? Well, in practice it means things like uh, someone says to you, which is un uh, unpleasant, uh, yeah, and this happens all the time, uh, yeah. This is kind of society is full of this. Uh, you hear things that are not really, you don't want to hear. Uh, and uh, so then you remember, well, actually, the world is like this. Uh, people speak in this way. Uh, every time I go out of my house, there is a chance somebody is going to say something that is not really pleasant. Uh, why do they say that? For all kinds of reasons. Sometimes because they had a difficult day, sometimes because they have been brought up in the wrong way, sometimes because they are just completely thoughtless and stupid. <laughs> sometimes because of all kinds of things, people do stupid things, yeah, and they say harsh things. Uh, but and this is the nature of people. Uh, they have to be like this. They cannot be different. Uh, uh, anger often comes from the idea that we can somehow change the world, and if we get angry, if we tell them off, somehow things will change. Uh, but uh, we cannot change the whole world. Uh, yeah? We cannot stop these things from happening. Uh, this is the nature of what things are. We can try to bring up our children in a good way so that they become nice and kind people. Sometimes we fail even at that. Uh, yeah? We try to do our best and still our children don't kind of follow exactly what they're supposed to do. In fact, it is impossible that our children should do exactly what we, th uh, we think they should do. Uh, uh, and sometimes it's good that children are a bit rebellious. Uh, Peop sometimes parents don't like rebellious children, but actually it's a good thing that children are rebellious. Uh, because if you are not rebellious, sometimes you get depressed instead. Uh, you need to assert your individuality a little bit. Yeah? This is important when you're young. Uh. So I, I tell my parents always, yeah, you should be glad I was a bit rebellious when I was young. Because yeah? it was good. Uh, psychologically it was good for me. Uh. My parents say, uh, maybe, not so sure. <laughs> So, uh, in a, my point is just here that uh, some degree of difficult things happening in life is part and parcel for how the world is set up. It has to be that way. Huh? So next time you hear someone saying something harsh, you say, yeah, I expected that, yeah? And then you kind of carry on uh, and you don't worry so much about it. Uh. And uh, then gradually you start to unravel this uh, automatic reactions that we have to our negative experience around us, uh, where we always react in a negative way to difficult experiences. Uh. The same thing with illness. Yeah, illness is very unpleasant, uh, and it's very easy to perhaps even get upset when you, you know, you you you, you have some accident or something, you break a leg or something. Uh, very unpleasant. But this body is bound to have these kind of accidents. This bad body is fragile. Uh, this body, when it meets metal and concrete and reality, it tends to kind of uh, you know, break apart and these kind of things. Uh, illness is part, part, part for the course. You have to expect that. Uh, problems in general in life is what we have to expect. And because of that, when it happens, uh, because we expect it, uh, because we say to the doctor, 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 something is right with me. Uh, I'm sick again today. Because we say that and we mean it because we know it's true, then of course these things have less power to affect our minds. And this is how we separate the mind from the body. The physical world is one thing uh, and the mind becomes more independent of those physical things. Uh. There's that nice sutta in the Vedana Sangyutta where the Buddha talks about the two darts uh, which you may have heard about. Uh, the two darts being the physical dart and the mental dart. Uh. You always have to feel the physical dart. Uh. 
We always have to feel the unpleasantness of the world, but we don't have to react to it in the wrong way with the mind. So the mind can remain quite equanimous and at ease, even though the world outside is difficult. Uh, so also remember the sutta that I read out before, the beautiful sutta on uh, the five ways of overcoming anger. Yeah? This is exactly uh, to counteract anger, the second hindrance here. Uh, and this is how you use yoniso manasikara, proper attention to overcome ill will in your life and negativity. Yeah? So uh, again, uh, knowing the causes of these things allows us, gives us the opportunity to counteract. Uh, and remember that the way we look at the world when we give rise to desire, when we give rise to ill will inside of us, these are just habits. And because they are habits, they can be changed, they can be turned around. Like that big cargo ship yeah, heading in one direction, they can be turned around and new habits can be created. And this is uh, kind of the positive message here from the Buddha. Okay, let us move on to the next one. And what fuels the arising of dullness and drowsiness? Uh, or when it has arisen, makes it increase and grow? Uh, there is discontent, sloth, yawning, sleepiness after eating, and mental sluggishness. Uh, frequent improper attention to them fuels the arising of dullness and drowsiness. Uh, or when it has arisen, makes it increase and grow? Uh, so what exactly does it mean to pay improper attention to these things? Uh, what does it mean in this case? Uh, it is maybe not, not quite as obvious as the previous one. The previous one, the Buddha gives a e very exact reason why these things arise. Here he doesn't really give an exact reason. But I think the uh, obvious one here is that you see the happiness in these things. Yeah? You see the happiness in sleeping, so you sleep a lot. Uh, you see the happiness in kind of being a bit dull, not being too sharp. Uh, and for that reason you kind of indulge uh, in that and the mind heads in that direction. And uh, it is uh, one of the consequences of dukkha, of having suffering in life, is sometimes that the mind becomes sluggish. Uh, why? Because we don't really want to be present when there is dukkha. So because when we don't want to be present, uh, the mind often can go to uh, sluggishness and, uh, and, and sloth and, and tiredness and sleepiness uh, uh, because of the unpleasantness of the situation. So you have to be aware of that. So in that case, you are seeing happiness in dullness. Yeah? Dull is happy because you don't have to experience the reality which is painful. Uh. So you have to understand that that is not really a solution. Uh. You have to understand that in the long run, this is actually more problematic. Uh. The more you see happiness in dullness, the more the mind will actually incline in that way. Yeah? And the more you understand that this, this is actually something to let go of and to get out of, so you can learn about the world, you can see causality, you can understand why suffering arises. When you dull out and you become sluggish, you can't see anything, you can't understand what's going on. Uh, yeah, it, the world becomes just a, a, you know, it's all kind of a bit of a blur and you don't know what's happening here. Yeah. So because of that, it's good to come out of that so you can actually react to re reality in a, in a more constructive way rather than just sleeping all day or, or something like that. Uh. I wonder, is that why teenagers sleep so much? Because they, uh, because they kind of they, the world kind of is difficult when you're a teenager? I don't know, there's probably more, more reasons than that. Uh. But uh, teenagers are, f are famous for sleeping a lot. Are, are they in Malaysia as well? Is that, is that the same everywhere? Yeah? Okay, same everywhere. Okay. So, uh, and uh, I think there are probably many, many more reasons for that. But uh, maybe the dukkha of teenage years is one of, one of those aspects. Uh. So, uh, and there is a nice, there are some nice similes in the suttas about uh, sloth and torpor. One of the similes is like it's being in prison. Uh. Yeah, when you are sloth and torpor, you are imprisoned uh, because you can't really escape. You're in this dull fog. You can't get out of the fog. Uh. Yeah, once you're in there, there's no way out again. Uh. And this is one of those problems with all of these hindrances. Once they ta overtake your mind, uh, very often it's hard to get out again. Uh. It's the same thing with ill will. Once it arises, uh, you can try to use the antidote, but the antidote becomes very weak. Uh. The antidote works best at the beginning, so you have to kind of catch it early, or even to train the mind not to get into it at all. Uh. But once it becomes strong, it is like you are trapped, trapped in these defilements. Uh. Once you become really dull, you kind of, you're, oh, you're struggling to get out of the fog, uh, and you can't really get out anymore. Uh. So remember not to find too much happiness in uh, that, uh, and that is when it often arises. Sometimes it can happen in meditation practice. Yeah, many of you tell me how it comes a point, and suddenly you become really slothful and tor 
you kind of fall asleep in your meditation. Huh? And sometimes what happens there is that you don't want to be present anymore. The mind just doesn't want to be here. You had enough. Yeah, okay. So the mind goes off into tiredness instead. Huh? So notice that. Uh, notice that thing. And uh, then do things that makes it more interesting to be present, uh, like adding more joy and pleasure to uh, the, the meditation object. Uh. Okay. Next one. Huh? And uh, what fuels the arising of restlessness and remorse, or when it has arisen, makes it increase and grow? There is the unsettled mind. Frequent improper attention to that fuels the arising of restlessness and remorse, or when it has arisen, makes it increase and grow. The unsettled mind, the avupassama uh, citta, uh, and uh, so again, this is about a wrong attention to the unsettled mind is a, a, an indulgence or being satisfied with or actually enjoying having a mind that is restless or unsettled. Yeah, this is part of the problem. Uh, and uh, you may, it's, it's kind of strange. Why? Why can? How can we enjoy the mind that is unsettled and that is restless and even agitated? What, what is it that makes us enjoy that? And one of the reasons why we enjoy that is because we identify so much with the doer again. I, I mentioned this before. We like to be the doer. We like to be the creators. We like to be the agents in our life. Because we identify with the doer, whenever we do, we satisfy that craving for our identity, for, for we expressing ourselves, we expressing our identity as a consequence. So doing actually gives rise to a sense of satisfaction because your identity is expressed. Uh, yeah? And this is kind of the whole point of having identity, is we want to express that, we want to be that. Uh. So whenever you act, and this is one of the reasons why people are attached to craving as well, uh, because craving makes you move, craving makes you act, it makes the doer important, because the doer can then pursue the object of that craving. Uh. So this is why crave, we even identify with craving, I am craving, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh. And then, because that makes you uh, gets the doer into action, and then we go out into the world and we try to get the object that, that we crave for. So this is a very kind of tricky trap, yeah? And uh, the way to get out of these tricky traps is that we have to be very careful when we watch what truly is happiness in the world. Uh, and the more you uh, observe the nature of restlessness, uh, yeah, uh, the more you start to realize and you compare it to the peace you sometimes get in your meditation practice, uh, it's very obvious that peace is much preferable to being restless, let, let alone agitated. Agitation actually is a very unpleasant state, especially when it becomes stronger. Uh, but uh, certainly peace is far superior uh, to the restlessness of the mind. And you have to just uh, notice that, and you have to start to identify with the peace, rather than identifying with the doer. Uh, and this is one of those things that we can do on the path, we can change the nature of our identity, what we identify with. Uh, and this is one of the things that happens in meditation practice. Uh, you start to chuck out those things that are more suffering and dukkha, like restlessness, uh, and you bring on board things that are more happiness. Uh, and in this way we're climbing the ladder of attachment, climbing the ladder of identity, identifying, attaching to things that are more refined and sublime, until eventually we can let go of the whole thing. Uh, but in the meantime, we need to attach to something, uh, so we attach to those things that are more sublime and nice. Uh. So gradually you overcome restlessness. Uh, and the Buddha has this beautiful simile again. I, uh, I mentioned the other day how the sutta say that uh, uh, we are a slave to craving. Uh, yeah, found in the Ratapala Sutta, Majjhimanikaya 82. Uh, a slave to craving, but the Buddha says that restlessness too. Uh, he compares it to being a slave. Uh, yeah, so whenever you're restless, uh, whenever you feel that you are urged on, you've got to do things, uh, the mind isn't still, you are like a slave. Uh, you're like someone whipping you over the back, saying, move. And you, s and you say, yes, sir, to the, to the craving, and you move around, and you enjoy it, or you think you enjoy it, because the doer inside of you wants to enjoy it. Uh, so, uh, and that is kind of, a, again, it's a nice uh, simile, because it, uh, puts, it shows us these things from a very different angle than what we normally see them as. Yeah? It is a kind of, you're being, nobody wants to be a slave, uh, or maybe s actually not, not usually, so, and this kind of shows you the problem with that. Uh, so, um, okay, 
we're coming to the last of the five uh, hindrances. Uh, and um, what fuels the arising of doubt, or when it has arisen, makes it increase or grow? There are things that are grounds for doubt. Uh, frequent, improper attention to them fuels the arising of doubt. Uh, or when it has arisen, makes it increase and grow. So, um, uh, what is it that? So, what are these things that uh, uh, are grounds for doubt? Uh, and uh, obviously, there is anything that uh, kind of uh, distracts you from uh, the, the teaching, anything that kind of leads you in the wrong direction, in a kind of wrong dhamma or whatever like that. And uh, if you listen too much to that, you might be kind of uh, taken away from the real dhamma. It's a bit like, you know, if you go on the internet, there's all these conspiracy theories around us. If you listen too much to the conspiracy theories, uh, after a while you start believing them. Uh, you start to believe that the, you know, the terrorist attacks in New York City on the uh, the Twin Towers was actually done by the American government. It's not believing in these things. Uh, but uh, I, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe some of you do believe in that. I don't know. I've got to be careful what I say here. Uh, but uh, so, th so these cons and there's so many strange conspiracy theories going around. Uh, and, you know, the world is ruled by lizards. That's kind of really strange stuff. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so th if you listen too much to those things, they start to after a while they start to become persuasive. This is the problem, because there's o you can always find evidence for anything you want, uh, and because you can always find evidence for anything you want, you can start believing in anything as well. Huh? So you have, to be, you have to be wise, you have to be careful, you have to be, um, you have to be judicious about where you get your information, what you listen to. Huh? Yeah, and uh, so, th so you, you read the suttas uh, and you stick to the word of the Buddha uh, and you because that you have a sense of confidence that this is good, this comes from someone who is wise, this is the real deal. But you don't kind of bring in too much ex uh, ex outside things. You can bring in a little bit because it's good to have a bit of perspective sometimes, uh, but you look at it more in tr from the point of view in the suttas uh, instead of looking at those things as uh, things in their own right. Uh, so... Uh, uh yeah, so it's just, so you, f you feel that, you feel kind of wh when, uh, you know, when do you go too far? Sometimes you can feel a little bit of doubt arising. Look at your mind, where it is coming from, why is, why is it happening? Uh, and sometimes it is good to have doubt, we should be careful as well. It is not as if doubt is always bad. Uh, sometimes there are things that are truly doubtful, that are truly uncertain. Uh, and sometimes, for example, you know, you have all these things, people say, oh, this monk is an arahant, that nun is an arahant. Uh, and, uh, it is very good grounds for having doubts when you hear that, because it actually is very, very hard to know. These are things that kind of become part of the popular culture. Everybody believes it, and if you think, I have doubts, you get told that's bad karma to say you have doubts, so then you shut up after that. But all of that is actually, uh, it is, there are grounds for being skeptical about many of these things, because otherwise there are just so many arahants around, yeah? They are everywhere. Every temple has a little arahant sitting there somewhere, and uh, that's just not how the world works. Arahants are very rare. So be discerning and have doubts when there are good grounds for having doubts. There are certain things in the suttas that are strange and don't really fit in with the rest of the suttas. So have it. don't t just take it on board blindly. Yeah? Sometimes it's good to have doubts. So all of this takes a degree of discernment, and that is the hard part. You have to be discerning. You have to kind of navigate uh, yourself between all of these things. Uh, and this sometimes can be quite difficult. Uh, so don't be too sure about yourself. Have a little bit of humility about these things. Yeah? And, uh, uh, and then if you have a bit of humility, you are likely to kind of find your right way. Never be too sure something is absolutely right. Never be too sure something is absolutely wrong. If someone is an arahant, don't say yes, definitely. Don't say no way. Say, okay, let's find out, yeah? Be a bit unsure. And that is a very uh, good way of looking at many of these things. Uh, so know when to have doubt, uh, the right kind of doubt, and know when to feel more sure about things. Uh, Sila leads to happiness. Okay, I don't think there should be much doubt about that. We all know that being kind it makes you happy. We all know that meditation practice can make you peaceful and uh, uh, will make you lead you towards something positive, clarity and all of that. Uh, these things are almost absolutely certain because we know it through our own experience. Uh, so if somebody tells you that meditation can, uh, will kind of lead you to the devil, uh, 
then uh, that is good reason to have doubt for that one. That, that is where you should have doubts, yeah, because that is where <laughs> it gets a bit, uh, gets a bit strange. Yeah. So it is a difficult one, but you can see there here that, that you, you, you have to be, use your discernment, uh, be smart, trust your own judgment, uh, don't rely on what other people say, because if you rely too much on what other people say, uh, very often you will just get that same silly view as the majority of people very often have. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, one of the nice uh, similes I should maybe mention very briefly before I stop uh, uh, about doubt. Doubt is like being in a desert, says the Buddha, or in the wilderness. Uh, in the wilderness where there is no food, there is no water, because if you ha don't have a refuge in the world, if you have complete doubt about Buddhism, you're not really sure if Buddhism makes any sense, or whether the Buddha was awake and you think it's all perhaps a lot of rubbish Buddhism, uh, and you don't have any kind of philosophy or anything to guide you in life, anywhere you can go for refuge and find some advice on how to live, uh, it's like you haven't got nourishment. Uh, yeah? You have nothing, you kind of feel a bit empty inside. Uh, there's nothing to really lead you in the right way. Uh, but when you have something meaningful in your life to guide you, it's like you have nourishment, you have water, you have food, uh, and you know how to live properly. Uh. So it's very, very useful to have some spiritual uh, guidance in life. Too many people in the world today, they live purely material existences, where material things is everything, and it's kind of empty here. Uh. Yeah, you feel emptiness inside, a, a hole inside. Uh, and so it's so nice to find something really valuable and something that is, uh, can guide us in a good way, but also is believable at the same time and actually makes sense. Uh, it's a very good thing, so it's a very precious thing here, yeah, and something that actually, in the end, makes life meaningful, where many of these other things are really hollow and empty here. Yeah. Anyway, let's have another break, yeah. and uh, maybe we can come back, and if you wish, we can do a little bit of meditation together uh, b just before lunch. So uh, I'll, come, I'll be back in about 15-20 minutes or so. Yeah. <laughs>